Let's kick things off. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stephen, uh, Community Team Lead at Common Room. Thanks for joining us today at the Uncommon Book Club. We're so excited to feature Mary Thingval, author of The Business Value of Developer Relations. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first, you'll see a couple polls, one here at the beginning to help us understand with your votes what questions we should uh, focus on at the end of our discussion. And then we'll have one before closing where you can kind of help us shape the future of events like these that we run. And second, uh, my colleague and community leader, Melanie, will be keeping an eye on the chat, answering any questions that you have along the way. So please keep those coming. And um, please also feel free to ask questions in the Q&A module as we have time set aside towards the end of the discussion for Mary to address those as well. So now let's begin. Uh, Mary, welcome. Uh, before we dive in uh, to kind of all things DevRel and community, can you briefly talk about kind of how you decided to write your book on developer relations? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, I think I mentioned to you when we were going through initial questions, I actually love this question because it's not the straightforward way that I think most people probably assume that it was. So I was actually at a conference in 2017, um, Southern California Linux Expo, for any of you who know that conference. And a handful of us were hanging out. We had often done a kind of evening before the conference started, a bunch of us who were in DevRel and community would get together and go out to dinner. Um, and so myself and um, a few friends and colleagues of mine were, were chatting over dinner and someone had mentioned, hey, you know, we're looking for new books. What books are people interested in writing? What topics do you think we need to be writing about? And I had heard the conversation start. And then a few minutes later, a friend and mentor of mine, Nathan Harvey, walked past me and kind of patted me on the shoulder and said, I'm so excited. This is going to be so much fun. And then just kept walking. And I had no idea what he was talking <laughs> about. And it turns out the end of that conversation had been hey, we really do need a book about developer relations. There isn't one out there. People are kind of halfway talking about writing one, but we haven't really seen anything yet. So that's a, a topic that really needs to be covered. And the decision was, great, there's a few of us who should co-write it together. Um, and I was basically volunteered along with Julie Gunderson and Jason Yee and Nathan and I found out about it after the decision had kind of been made by these other three people. <laughs> and so it was this, you know, all of a sudden, hey, I'm kind of not not seriously roped in, but but I've been volunteered to to help write this book. Um, I, I have a background in writing. I'm a journalism major. And so I've always enjoyed writing and, and storytelling. And so I wasn't wasn't necessarily opposed to it and was grateful that I had a team to work with on it. Um, but then as we started kind of working through the logistics of things and we had gotten to a point where we had done a, a brainstorming session about what are all of the different topics that we need to cover and then how do those kind of group into possible chapters. So we'd gotten that far, had barely started writing. I had written the first few pages and one by one, each of the other authors kind of came back and said, hey, I don't actually know if I have time for this based on personal situations, professional situations, the time that I was hoping for, you know, work with helping me out here isn't coming through, all of these types of things. And so I wound up as the, the solo author wow. after being the last one volunteered to kind of join this group. Um, but I often say, and I actually mentioned this in the acknowledgments in the book as well, that if if I hadn't been pushed in that direction, um, and if we hadn't had a chance to do kind of that brainstorming session and the topics dump and, and all of those types of things, I likely never would have done this on my own because I wouldn't have known where to start. So I'm very grateful for having been volunteered um, and still have a great relationship with all three of those other folks, which is good. Um, but it's definitely a, a fun story of kind of how the book came to be. Yeah, it's almost like a volume volun told you to do it and exactly then, and, and exactly look, yeah look what happened you know <laughs> yes, uh, it's funny yes. kind of how things turn out like that yeah absolutely uh, and so you start off your book uh by grounding the reader in a definition of technical community and so sure. as a refresher for the audience here uh can you provide yes. a quick recap 
Absolutely. So part of the reason we start with definitions is just to make sure we're all on the same page. I believe very strongly it's important to, to all be using the same language and the same words. Um, and part of the reason why we wanted to start with that definition of community is because, as I mentioned in the book, there are so many different definitions and so many different things that people assume community is, right? The biggest thing that really set kind of our definition of community apart from the others that we had seen at that point was this idea that it's not just, you know, people who are coming together or people who share similar ideas or opinions, but it's really folks who not only share those common principles, but are also wanting to really share principles and practices and, and develop those practices that are really going to help other people in that community, in that group thrive. And so it's not just, hey, I'm going to show up and learn, but it's, hey, I'm going to show up and learn and contribute and give back. And then once I know more, maybe I'll be presenting or maybe I'll be the one writing the content or, or participating and helping answer questions. So it's really got that participatory element to it that I think is so important um, that it's not just a, a unidirectional community, but there's there's participation in both ways. Yeah, that, I think that give and take is like super important and like mm-hmm. that feeling of, of togetherness and we're yeah. kind of all in all in together. Yes. Um, and there are a couple of nuances that you talked about later on in the book, sure. you, know, you know, some unique traits of open source communities versus pr- proprietary ones. Mm-hmm. Can you dive a little into that? And then also, you know, what makes open source communities in particular you know, unique and what can we learn from uh, from open source communities? Absolutely. So this this idea of kind of what sets the open source communities apart from proprietary communities actually comes from a concept that John O. Bacon talked about in his book, Art of Community, years ago at this point, Um, this kind of read versus write community, right? So it's there's some communities where it really is just I'm consuming the information and maybe I'm creating some of that information, but I'm not actively contributing back to the product. Um, I'm giving feedback, I'm giving information, I'm, I'm participating in, in Q and A's and things like that, but I'm not um, fundamentally changing the product myself versus right communities where you're not only invested because you're a consumer, but you're also invested because you're actively helping to build the product. And so this idea of, you know, open source software, which for those of you who aren't familiar, um, it literally means that the the code that the software is written on, that the product uses to run is available, is open to anyone. Um, You can build on top of it. You can uh, contribute back to it. You can submit features. You can really take part in being involved in this community versus proprietary communities, which are often used as kind of that that read community, right? You're consuming things from it. And I think something that makes open source communities really unique is that, and we we see this at Komunda, the, the company that I work at full-time now, we see it often where those people who are choosing to give up their own time to really contribute back and... Uh, not only speak up and give us feedback, but literally contribute code that then gets adopted into the product, they're far more invested in what's going on and in how things are being used. And so they they feel more strongly about that. They're far more engaged. They're more likely to help other people stay more engaged uh, or help other people solve the problems that they're facing. And so it's, it's definitely a unique environment that I... I think you can have in a proprietary product that people are really passionate about as well. But with open source, you then have people who are giving back in a a very practical way and having a big impact as a result of that. I think there's a lot of, of lessons that we can learn from open source communities in particular, as far as how they handle contributions, um, how they ask for those contributions, how they accept contributions. Uh, there's, there are some code contributions and there are some non-code contributions and they're viewed equally valuable, equally Mm -hmm. important because there's people who will, you know, update the documentation, help make the documentation far more clear. Um, they'll submit feature requests or issues and very detailed, um, descriptions of here's the bugs that I found or the issues that we're facing and then help other people to, to debug those or, or test that code out afterward. So there's a lot of different ways that people can give back and open source communities as a result tend to be very 
welcoming, very friendly, very open, very um, good places for people who are new to, to development, new to engineering, perhaps to get started. That's of course not true across the board. There are some open source communities that are literally known for not being welcoming <laughs> and they're not the greatest places to get started. Um, but I think for the most part, there's, there's a lot of places, you know, Kubernetes is one of them. And I mentioned this in the book that, you know, it's, it's very much the, you participate, you're here, you're a valued part of the community, no matter how you're participating. And we want to make sure that people feel welcome to, to give back and participate and whatever way that they're able to. Yeah. And it seems like it, that kind of two way, uh, interaction like really helps build super passionate members within that community yes. and yeah. very different ways of recognition and impact and all those mm -hmm. things. So mm -hmm. that's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, those insights and definitions. Sure. Uh, I wanted to kind of transition to, you know, my favorite passage and, and we talked about this over email uh, in, yeah. in the book, um, which is the DevRel, the DevRel mantra that you share mm -hmm. to the community. I represent the company. To the company, I represent the community. I must have both of their interests in mind at all times. Yeah. yeah. So what advice um, do you have to kind of help successfully maintain what seems like a pretty monumental juggling act? It is, it is definitely a juggling act. Um, I think the biggest thing here is there's, there's a lot of times when I feel like we overthink this, right? We feel like we have to be perfect. We can't um, possibly show up with, you know, a hair out of place or the wrong word that we say in the title of our talk or anything like that, right? We have the impression that, well, I'm, I'm a representative, so I have to be officially representing, which means I need to know everything. I need to have an answer to every single question. I need to be completely on at all times. And that's not true. Um, I think it's, it's far more important to be human, be available, um, be accessible to people. And part of that is saying, hey, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know the person to point you to, right? Or I don't know the answer to that question and let's figure it out together. Let's dig into the documentation. Let's dig into the code. Let's find the answer together. And so in doing that, you're representing the company. You're, you're representing that we are... Um, you know, we value the community, we value the feedback, we value the information that you're bringing to us. And you're being authentic as well in saying, I don't know everything and that's okay. And I don't need to know everything. Um, but then the idea of then taking that authenticity that you're displaying with the community member and taking that back internally as well is a huge part of it. Because I've worked with a number of companies when I was consulting who, you know, everything was, was external, everything was to the community. And so very little of what they did was then going back internally and saying, Hey, by the way, we went out to these places and we had these conversations and we did these things. And here's the feedback that we heard and the information that, that people gave us and the conversations that we had. And so there were companies that I went and worked with where, you know, employees were there for like leaders in the company had been there for three or four years. And I'd ask them, well, cool to you, what does the developer relations team do at the company? And their answer was, I don't really know. I'm like, okay, but you've, you've worked at the company for three or four years <laughs> and you're a leader that they should be interacting with fairly often what do you mean you don't know? And they're like, well, I mean, they give talks at conferences and they talk to our community members. And that's about the extent of what I know. And so if we're not taking that information back internally, if we're not engaging with the other teams across the company, I'm, I'm not surprised that companies are going, I don't actually understand what it is the developer relations team does or what it is that the community team does. And therefore, laying the team off when budget becomes an issue or things like that, because there's no internal awareness of here's what we're doing. Here's how we can be of help to you, right? That internal enablement of your coworkers to say, Hey, I actually know a lot about that project that someone's asking about a prospect is asking about, do you want me to hop on the call with you and try and walk through the code on that side of things? Um, or, working with the product team and saying, hey, for the roadmap, 
here's the feedback that I'm getting. I can give you additional insights into these pieces of feedback that we're hearing and considering for the next roadmap. And so the more that we're spending time internally at the company, talking to people and making them aware of what projects we're involved in, making them aware of what the community is saying, while at the same time being outside, talking to the community members and getting additional feedback and spending time with them and being authentic with them, we, we really have to have both of those pieces in mind at all times, because if we don't, we're either going to be shortchanging the community and not giving them the time and attention that they deserve, or not putting ourselves in a position of value internally in the company. And also, again, shortchanging the community because we're not spending time in the company explaining, here's the, the pieces that we need to advocate for on behalf of the community members. It sounds like that's multiple full-time jobs at once. Like it can doing be. all the external, all the internal, <laughs> but you have to do both. It, it um, can be, <laughs> it can be. And I think that's, I actually had a conversation with someone about this this morning. I think that's where prioritization has to happen, right? Um, I think, and this is a bit of a stereotype, but the, the types of people who really tend to enjoy developer relations and community building tend to be people who have a hard time saying no. And so, you know, community member comes up and goes, hey, I'd really love you to come give a talk at my conference on this, or I'd really love for you to write this blog post, or I'd really love for you to do this thing. And you go, yeah, that sounds great. No problem. I'll totally do it. And if you do that, even if it's just five times a week, right, then you've got three blog posts and two conference talks that you have to give in the next three weeks, plus everything you already signed up to accomplish the week before, because there were probably five or seven people that you said yes to the week before, <laughs> Right. And so something that I'm constantly coaching my team on, something that I'm constantly coaching external folks on as well is you have to figure out how you prioritize your work. What of the things you're being asked to do are the most valuable or have the most potential for good for either the company or the community? One of the biggest things I always point back to is do the activities that I'm involved in impact the, the overarching company goals? Um, is everything that I'm doing somehow related? And not in the sense of, you know, the company wants to triple our ARR this year. I personally signed four different prospects, right? That's not, not what I'm talking about. But if the goal is to, tr to triple the ARR, then what am I doing to make sure more people are aware of the fact that we're out here? What am I doing to make the product easier to use to increase adoption? What am I doing to help um, explore new communities and find additional industries that might find our product useful? Actually, with that, that last point uh, is a nice yeah. segue <laughs> into You're the welcome. next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I wanted to ask you about, which was around finding and not building a mm -hmm. community. Uh, and you yeah. talk about in your book, when it comes to community platforms, it's about meeting your community where they are. It's not yeah. build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, kind of what's your thinking behind this? And you did, uh, do you have like a recommended approach to identify who that primary audience should be to focus on? That's a great question. Um, so there's not a, a magic answer to say, you know, ask this question and, and you'll know exactly who your audience is. Um, but I will say the, the thing that I always have people start with is who are the people who are most successful with your product, right? Are they front end engineers? Are they back end engineers? Are they the DevOps team? Is it someone else entirely? Um, but what's your primary current community of users um, and then building up those personas. And so then being able to say, great, you know, they are front end developers who use React, who use these other platforms or these other uh, frameworks, and they're trying to answer these questions and here's their pain points. Because once you have a fleshed out persona like that, then you can go, okay, great. Where do these people hang out? What types of resources are they looking for? And if you don't know the answers to those questions, go talk to your community members <laughs> and just say, hey, I'd love to hop on a 15 minute call with you. I know you know you tend to use our product to solve these issues, these, these problems. Um, where are the places that you get more information about process automation? Where are the places you get more information about microservices? Where are the places where you get more information about cloud? And by listening to them as the people who are using your products currently, 
you're then able to kind of go, okay, great. There's four or five different places that they said they tend to hang out. Chances are, if those get repeated by another community member, you're going to find a quorum of, of community members or potential community members in those places. And then that's where I start experimenting, right? Where if you have a list of, hey, here's the five top communities that people are really hanging out in that we think our community is going to be a part of, then you start kind of just go hang out in that community. Um, And when I say go hang out, I actually mean go hang out, like set an hour a day aside and go read the latest conversations, find out what people are talking about. Um, Look at the topics of conversation that are coming up on a regular basis. And don't, don't hop in there and say, hey, I'm here and I'm from this company and let me know if we can help to solve any problems because we do these awesome things, <laughs> right? Because that the second that you do that, everybody's going to go, okay, I don't want to talk to that person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's the best, the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is people go, nope, sorry, that violates our, our code of conduct or our rules and you're no longer a part of this community. Um, but by going in and lurking, observing, keeping an eye on what the conversations are, what's going on, you have an opportunity to learn. And it might be that you do that for a week with a particular community and you go, actually, this isn't the right place. This isn't a place where our community is likely hanging out or the question, right questions aren't being asked here. Um, but if you can establish, you know, hey, this quarter, we're going to go research five additional um, places to, to go see if that's a viable place for our community to be, then you can come back at the end of that and go, great. Yes. We hit, you know, all five of those, um, three of them have potential for next quarter. And then you can start building up a little bit more of a plan to be more intentional about your involvement, right? Start answering questions, start pointing people back to the resources that you have, or start creating resources so that you can actually have those resources to reference later or, you know, delegate those resources to other people in your company if you need to. Yeah. This makes me think like kind of your point earlier about being human, kind of being humble, right? That's the approach you take when you join yeah. that's as, as a member of the community and not necessarily a representative of this company. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And then speaking kind of with your actions as opposed to with your words, right? And saying, yes. Hey, tell me what you need. I'll, I'll get it for you. It's like, yeah. here, I made this for you because I listened and saw what, yes. what y'all needed. Yes. Um, and let me know what you think, right? Let's build mm-hmm. it together. Um, exactly. Exactly. And it's, yeah, and it sounds like there's lots of centers of gravities that already exist out there of these communities. So rather than try and make your own, which is a right. lot of work, yeah. you go there and, and kind of find one that, that might work out. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And kind of related to this topic, we had a question from uh, a community member that was submitted during registration, yeah. uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. So they asked, how do you build a, a true community? versus an audience without an owned platform? And are there any examples uh, that come to mind for you? That's a fantastic question. Um, So my first community position uh, was this. (laughs) Um, It was in the DevOps space. I worked at O'Reilly Media. Um, I was in charge of kind of our, what we called our velocity area at that point, which was largely DevOps and, and some web performance. And so we had our our conferences once a year. We had the books that we published and things like that. But I was largely looking for how do I connect with these people? How do I get to know these people without having, you know, we have a a forum that you can come and ask and answer questions on on our site. And so I legit just went and started building one-on-one relationships. And there are times when that's not scalable, but when you're first getting started, that's, that's the biggest way that I've found to be effective. And so I literally, and this was obviously pre COVID, this was back in 2008, 2009. Um, but I would just go on the road for a couple of weeks and look in our database and go, great, here's who I know is in this area of the, you know, DevOps leaders or thought leaders or people that are looked up to in these areas. Here's everyone who lives in the New York area. And I'm essentially going to do a cold call email and email them and say, hey, I would love to talk to you. I'd love to get your feedback on what are you what are you expecting? What are you thinking about the DevOps space? Um, what do you see as new opportunities? Um, or what, again, where are you going to get your information, right? This was pre-Slack and all of that. So there were no Slack groups and things, but 
Are there forums you're looking at? Are there conferences you're attending? Are there things that you're involved with? Um, and more often than not, those people were extremely happy to meet with me. And so, you know, we'd get together for coffee. I would buy their coffee. We'd have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and they would then introduce me to three or four other people. And so I built for the first several years that I was in community, built that community of people literally with just one-on-one -on -one relationships. And as a result of that, when I went to Chef Software, I was then able to go, okay, cool. This person is in my community. These people are in my community. It's, it's a community that's a DevOps community, not an O'Reilly community, but a DevOps related community because these are the topics of conversation that we're involved in. And because of that, people then come to me or uh, look to me for additional introductions or for me to introduce them to other people. And so especially when you're first getting started, building those one-on-one -on -one relationships is extremely helpful. And you might find a point then, that tipping point of, cool, I'm now at a point where I have, you know, 30 people that I'm talking to on a regular basis about these topics that all have to do with our product. You know what, if there's 30 of us and I'm introducing all 30 of those people to everyone else in this group, let's start an owned platform because now there's a reason for it and there's activity around it. Mm -hmm. And there's more of a chance that people are actually going to stay engaged at this point rather than, Hey, 30 people that I've never met. Do you want to want to come over here and talk <laughs> to me about these things? Like, it's probably not going to happen. Now, that's a really interesting reframe of how kind of in the beginning, it's almost as if or it is the people are more important than where or how you meet because it's really 100%. about build, building 100%. the relationships. But then that tipping point that you just raised about, all right, now that we have this established kind of network, yes. let's find a place to gather. That's yeah. super yeah. interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the one thing I will caveat that with is that even after you've found a good platform and a good cadence of conversation with people and you decide to, to open your own owned forum, the people are still more important than the platform. It's Absolutely. still, you know, look, if this platform isn't working for us, let's find something else. Let's figure out where else we should be or what else we should be doing. Um, and having those conversations openly with your community about, hey, I'm thinking of starting a Slack group so that all of us can talk more often, or I'm thinking of starting a Discord, or I'm thinking of opening a discourse forum that then the 30 of you can help answer questions from our other community members. Kind of as, you know, what do you, what do you think about that? How might that work? Yeah, I think that transparency is so key and, and not being scared of like either being wrong or being, yeah. you know, uh, maybe angering the community, but just mm -hmm. explaining your thinking. Cause that's kind of yes. what we did when we opened our Slack for uncommon is, Hey, this is why we did it. We, you know, yes. this is our thinking, this is the purpose, but let's work on it together. Um, what yeah. do you want next? Um, yes. So I love, I love yes. that. Um, and then kind of another one more on the, this, this meaty like community platform, yeah. uh, another community question or member question from the community member. Um, you know, what are some practical techniques to kind of improve and build a community and do mm -hmm. kind of all this legwork that you just talked about without necessarily, you know, wholesale, you know, hiring a DevRel team, you know, how do you encourage and structure, create and incentivize this content that you talked about uh, yeah. to fill that gap? <laughs> I, I love this question um, because I, I see a lot of companies asking this and it's, I understand why they're asking this question, but it's also, I will say one of the more controversial questions um, because, and this, I, I don't want to put words in the person's mouth who asked this, but the way that I normally see this being asked is from decision makers and budget holders at companies who go, I really don't want to have to pay someone to do all of this until we understand that there's value there. So let's just you do a little bit, you do a little bit, you do a little bit, but it's no one's real priority and we'll just see what works. And more often than not, when I see that happening, because it's not a priority for any one person and because those people that that work is kind of farmed off to, they don't usually understand how to do it or what it is or what the purpose is behind it or why it's valuable. It just doesn't happen. And so then the, the decision maker goes, well, 
nothing really worked. It's not worth in, you know, investing in. We aren't actually going to hire a DevRel team. That's not going to work for our company. We don't need a community. We're good. Let's move on. Which might not be the case. <laughs> right. And so I think. I think if you aren't able to make the the business case right now for hiring someone to focus on developer relations, finding someone at your company who cares about that topic, who is passionate about that topic is something that you have to start with. Because if you can find someone, maybe it's one of your engineers who is already talking to the community, already attending conferences, already very interested in getting feedback from people who are actively using the product. Maybe it's a product manager who wants that product feedback, right? But if you can find someone like that who intrinsically understands or instinctively understands the intrinsic value there, then they'll be more motivated to to help out with that. Um, I would say start with creating content. Um, If you have an excellent writer on your team, but you have, and you have engineers who don't want to write, but have great stories to tell, go straight some of those stories, right? Hop onto a 30 minute Zoom call with them, record the Zoom call, have the person transcribe it afterward, make it a little more storytelling, you know, spice it up a little bit with, with more information and kind of get the flow right. And then send it back to the engineer and go, great. Do we have your permission to publish this? Does this work? Cool. And start creating content in those types of ways where it's not taking someone's full time or taking their attention away, but you're using the talents of the people that you have to kind of fill those gaps along the way. So it's, it's controversial. um, But I think if you can do it in a way where, you know, Hey, this would be a good investment. I just need to prove it. Finding those little um, allies in different companies or in different departments, excuse me, uh, to be able to say, Hey, you really want to get product feedback from our customers. Can I get your help to, you know, help with phrasing this or help with having one-on-one calls more often or things like that? Hey, you really want to get out and attend a conference and speak at a conference, but you're a little unsure about your speaking ability. Let me give you some speaking coaching and let's submit a couple CFPs and see what happens, right? So finding those people who are invested in that um, and passionate about it, I think is the, the best way to get started if you weren't able to get budget yet. But if you can get budget... I highly recommend getting budget and having one person actually connected to that, that mission. Thank you. Yeah. That was great. Um, Switching gears a little bit to, to the success, to like success metrics now moving further kind of along. Um, You talk about, uh, you know, the need uh, more balancing everything. I feel like the takeaway from your book was everything is a balance. Uh, So (laughs) specifically with success metrics, it's balancing, Mm -hmm. you know, measuring with your brain versus your gut, but also Mm -hmm. balancing reporting metrics versus the, the, you know, engaging actively, which you had talked about before um, with the community. And, you know, to help maintain focus, you shared uh, these three retrospective questions to ask. Um, Can you kind of speak to what these questions are? and how they can be incorporated into regularly checking the health uh, of your community or communities? Absolutely. So part of the reason I think it's so important to ask these questions is because we were talking earlier about, you know, there's 18 different things you could choose to do on any one day and tomorrow there's going to be another 18. And so making sure you're pausing and, and taking the time to actually think through what is going well? What could we be doing better? What should we be doing differently going forward helps you to be able to actually evaluate what you're involved in uh, and evaluate the the usefulness of what you're doing. Um, Because I think so often, because we have so much on our plate and so much on the backlog and so many things we could be involved in, we finish one thing and kind of go, great, that's done, move on, right? And there's so, so few times when we actually go, cool, that's done for the next six months. Let me keep a loose eye on how it's doing. How did it perform? Did it do what I set out for it to do or not? Um, One of the things that I stress all the time with my team at Kamunda is we have a a good amount of freedom as far as what projects do we want to do? What programs do we want to test? What do we want to get started with and kind of... what work do they want to be doing on a regular basis? The, the caveat with that is you have to have success metrics 
for any project that you start, right? We do not start a project without knowing here's the things that we're tracking. Here's the things that we're looking for. And some of that is quantitative. Some of it is, you know, hey, how many click-throughs did we get? How many people clicked through or clicked? How many people read the article? How many people clicked through back to our main page? Those types of very um, quantifiable metrics that are sometimes vanity metrics to a certain extent. But we have those as well as, hey, how many people um, stopped asking this question in the support forums, right? As in, did this, did this blog post take care of the documentation hole that was there? Or when we updated the documentation, did we stop getting support requests for this particular thing? And so making sure that there's ways that we can kind of go, okay, gut feeling, are we getting fewer questions about this general topic? Or sometimes you can measure that quantitatively too, right? You've got labels, you've got tags that you can track in your support network, but being able to say, hey, does this feel better? Does the community seem to be responding to this feature better than they were before? Has to be balanced with, you know, well, okay, the community seems to be responding better to that feature, but also we had 20 people total read the blog post, which means they're not feeling better about that feature because of the blog post. <laughs> Because not enough people read the blog post for it to have been effective, right? And so being able to balance those two things, I think, is super important. And asking these types of questions about, okay, hang on, let's let's pause. What do we like about what we're doing? What do we not like about what we're doing? What does the community like about what we're doing or not doing? And how do we do all of this better gives you an opportunity to not constantly be running, but actually to stop and think through what is it that we're doing and what what things should we be doing differently yeah it kind of forces you to um think about kind of what's your north star like what do we, you know what's mm -hmm. the purpose for all this work and because it's easy to get stuck in the all right this talk and the other talk and this other yes. post and this other thing and then yeah. next thing you know it's like eight months have passed right um, exactly you know? <laughs> um, exactly and another uh thing that you mentioned around being successful in devrel is mm -hmm. large amounts of trust that's required from the developer community yes. and this trust or social capital mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, really, really, really hard to earn kind of as you've been describing, yeah. Yeah. But, in, but incredibly easy to lose. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of, can you share any best practices or tips um, to maintain this high level of, a high level of trust with, with the community? And then also, you know, are there ways to kind of recover if, you know, mm -hmm. again, we're all human, right? You make mm -hmm. a blunder, mm -hmm. you know, how do you recover uh, yeah. with the community as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a couple of things here. Um, the ability to gain or maintain that trust, I think, is not something that only the DevRel team can do. It's something that has to be a commitment from the company. And so I've, I've seen companies, I've worked with DevRel teams, where the DevRel team is fantastic about soliciting feedback or making sure that they've taken note of the issues that people are having, they're great at you know scouring the forums for patterns and identifying those patterns and what could be done to fix it and all of these types of things. And then the product team goes, cool, I don't have time for any of that. Like, thanks for passing it along. But like, none of that is on the roadmap. None of that is gonna happen. The earliest any of that might be taken into account is like a year and a half from now. And so there's situations like that where the community starts to learn like, okay, well, they're not listening anyway. So why should I take the time to attend a product feedback session? Why should I reach out to the developer relations person or the community person and give my feedback? Because nothing's going to happen with it anyway. So if I run into problems or there's bugs that need to be fixed, or I can't use the product because I need this feature and they don't have it on the roadmap, I'm out of luck and there's no real point in my continuing to invest in the community when they're not willing to invest in me. So I think making sure that you have buy-in from product, right? Maybe it's, hey, for every uh, release that we have, we have one community piece of feedback that's, that's integrated into the roadmap. Um, something that I've seen be very effective for DevRel teams in, in communicating that feedback is, you know, for every product that you're representing, you have a list of five pieces of key feedback from the community. And those are our top five. It's only the top five. 
that top five might change on a weekly basis, but the product manager always knows, look, if you're looking for something that will really, really help the community and make people really happy, here's what you should do. But you have to have that commitment from product, which means you also have to have the commitment from engineering, which means you also have to have the commitment from senior leadership who says, yeah, that's the direction that we want to go in. And it really boils down to, you know, is is community actually valued by the company or is it just, hey, we just want to put out a product and get enterprise customers. Um, And the the interesting thing to me is when companies go, well, I mean, the community is important, but really we care about the money, right? And what people often aren't stopping to think about is that if you're taking care of the people who are using your product and making them feel good about giving feedback and acting on that feedback and showing them that, that you're listening, those customers aren't going to leave. <laughs> they're going to stick around. They're not going to go anywhere. They're going to tell everybody about you. And at the end of the day, you're going to wind up with more paying customers because the community now knows we can trust you and you have our best interests in mind. And you're actually working toward making this a far more effective product for all of us. And I think when it comes to you know earning that trust back, being honest about the mistakes that you've made. You know, when you approach the community the next time for product feedback, openly saying, hey, we know the last three times that we've come to you with this request, we haven't been able to follow through on it. As a team, here's what we're working on. Here's how we're trying to make that a better experience for you. Here's the the responses that we have. And look, we are committing upfront without even having this conversation. We are committing upfront to applying at least one of these suggestions to our next roadmap for our next release. And so being able to to make that commitment, and you might still have people that are very hesitant to to step up and give that feedback and and offer that information and and take their own time for that. But if you're upfront about, hey, we screwed up and we know it, and here's what we're doing to fix it, it's a a step in the right direction, at least to say, we're listening and we, we know that we need to do better in the future. Yeah, so it sounds like not only do you have to earn the trust of the, the community, but you have to earn the trust of all your internal stakeholders too. Right. Because it's all connected, like you were saying. Yes. Um, and then it also goes back to the vulnerability and, and yeah. the humbleness uh, mm-hmm. and showing that you're not perfect, even though you may be working at this big, you know, mega yeah. corporation. It's like, again, we're all run by humans uh, yeah. and we're yeah. all just trying to do it together. So yeah. I, I, yeah. I see that message being repeated. Yes. Um, over and over. And I think, yes. And I, and I think it's hard to basically admit that publicly admit and like on the internet. So it's like going to be forever remembered and, and yeah. you know, that you made a mistake and it's associated yeah. with you and all those things. But I think right. Right. it sounds like that's the, the way to like um, earn that trust and really mm-hmm. win them over. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazingly, uh, I want to make sure we have time for questions from the live chat. So I may yes. ask the last the book club question. Um, yeah, yeah. so there is, you know, so much great information in the book and, and all the appendices that you have in there as well. Can you share, you know, three concrete actions you'd suggest people take after, um, reading the book, any kind of high impact actions or questions, uh, that would make a good starting point? Sure. So I think the, the first one is really know who your audience is. Um, we talked about this a little bit before, but making sure that you, you actually know, here's the people that we're talking to, here's their needs and never losing sight of the fact that you're working essentially for the community, right? The company's paying your, your paycheck. Um, but the work that you're doing is, is for the community. And so you need to know, here's their common needs. Here's their pain points. Here's the things that we need to solve for them in order to make this effective. Um, We talked about this a little bit earlier, always tying your efforts back to company goals, always making sure that, you know, if someone goes, hey, why are you doing this particular program or uh, writing this material, you know, this series of blog posts or trying these experiments, you're able to say, oh, well, these blog posts have to do with, you know, our basic industry as a whole, not vendor specific, but how best practices in this area, which then leads to greater awareness of that topic, which then points people back to our company. Because if people know about process automation, they know about Kunda, right? And so drawing that line back so that you're always ready to answer those questions is a huge part of that and really helps 
solidify your relationship with the community stakeholder or the company stakeholder, excuse me. Um, because if they see that you're able to provide those quick answers, then they start to learn to trust like, oh, okay. They know what they're talking about. They're an expert in their field and they'll likely start coming back to you when they have needs or things that they could use advice for or help on or any of those things where they go, okay, hang on. I don't know the community as well. Steven does. Let me go back and talk to him about what's going on and what topics I should, should touch on for this piece of content because he's far more aware of what's going on there. Um, and the last thing I would say is don't be afraid to speak up and really insist that your voice is heard. Um, I think so often it goes hand in hand with, you know, we, we tend to be people who say yes to everything. Um, we also have a tendency to say, okay, well, I said my piece and I, I did what I could, but it's not, it's not getting through. And so I think remembering that, you know, sometimes just because it makes sense to you doesn't mean it necessarily makes sense to other people at the company, making sure that you're speaking their language and really, um, translating to a certain extent, the, the communication from the community back into the company so that your voice is heard because you are the voice of the community member. And so you're representing, like we talked about at the beginning, right? You're representing the community back to the company and it's important that that is heard. And so, you know, making choices about which times you need to say, actually, no, I'm going to put my foot down. This needs to be said. This is not going in a good direction. I need you to listen to me because this is what I know. This is what I do. Right. And making sure that you're, you're speaking up loud enough and in a way that people are going to understand um, that they can actually hear and hear you advocate for the community and in a way that makes sense to them. Yeah. You're like their representative in, mm -hmm. in, in those company meetings. Yeah. You're literally their advocate. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you uh, for that. Yeah. Um, and for such an amazing discussion, if we had more time, I'm sure we could keep on going. Um, did did want to, uh, we did get a couple of uh, questions in the chat. So I'll just cool. read those and, and we'll go get through as many as we can. Um, so Jeff asked, um, to what degree should developer relations slash advocacy be accountable for marketing lead gen and sales? Mm -hmm. um, you know, should there be an ideological and behavioral barrier mm. between DevRel and regular organizations? And kind of how does that tie back to, you know, the company goals that you just talked about as well? Yeah, yeah, that is a great question. Um, so personally, I, I have a strong belief and I talk about this a little bit in the book. I've tweeted about this before. I've talked to a lot of people about it at different conferences. I believe very strongly that developer relations should not be accountable for marketing leads and should not be accountable for sales revenue. Um, I There are times when what we are working on and what we are doing will contribute to those efforts. And that's fantastic. But there's a big, uh, in my opinion, a big uh, conflict between building relationships and money. Um, that's not always true, but I think it is more often true than not. And so if your intent, if what you're telling the community is, hey, I really want to help you. What can I do to make this easier? Um, what solutions are you looking for? Let me go advocate for that internally. What content can I write? What can I help you find the answers to? Those types of things. And then you turn around and go, cool. Um, now the company or the product is going to cost you 50K a year. Are we good? We're good? Like, I'm going to go do this for you. So you're good because you can sign the, the contract now because we have everything we need. Like, it just, it makes things so awkward and it degrades that authenticity and that vulnerability that we've been talking about. And so it's far easier, in my opinion, to have that conversation about what needs can I meet? Where can I make things easier for you? How do I help you find the actual solution that's going to make you the most successful, whether that's our product or not? And then once that community member is ready to go to sales, they're going to come to you because they're the person that they've talked to this entire time. They're not going to fill out the form on the website ad hoc, right? Without talking to you first. So when they do come to you, then you figure out who's the right salesperson to hand them off to and make that introduction, right? And then you you do that that warm handoff that DevRel qualified lead idea of you know hand hand people off to the the correct people in the company whether that's a marketing person for a case study whether that's recruiting for 
you know, a possible engineering role or sales for these opportunities to, to make that transition to that person becoming a, an enterprise customer. Yeah. So it kind of goes back to, I feel like proving the, like showing the value that you bring mm-hmm. first, then yes. recognizing what that value is and then kind of other, other things will work themselves out, but yeah. you have to yeah. get to that point. Yeah, exactly. And, and it could take exactly. a while. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think on the internal side of things, though, having an excellent relationship with the sales team is huge because you can often provide advice, right, on the technical decks that sales engineering is going out with or the um, slogans that marketing is using to get attention on the website, right? Offering feedback as far as like, hey, that's really going to resonate with the community. That's fantastic. Or on the other hand, that's going to turn a lot of people off and we should remove that from the website right now. (laughs) Right. But because you're the subject matter expert for the people who are using your software, you're often able to provide that insight that other people at the company may not have. And so building that relationship of trust and authenticity with those other teams internally is super important so that when you do say that's not going to go well. And if we keep going forward with that sales messaging, we're going to lose sales. We're going to churn customers. We're not going to get new customers in the future that people actually listen and they actually hear you and they're willing to have that conversation because they know and trust your, your expertise in that area because you've already built that relationship internally as well. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds, sounds like the ideal scenario. Yeah, for sure. Um, All right. We have another question here from the chat. Uh, Nick asked uh, what happens if your community uh, you know, it has a single digit number of members. It's in a, a new emerging field. It doesn't have a market yet. How would you go about trying to, to grow them from zero? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, it goes back to some of what I was talking about earlier with my experience in, in DevOps at O'Reilly, where, you know, DevOps was new. And so we knew a handful of people and it was literally my reaching out to those people and going, hi, can I buy you a coffee? (laughs) Can we talk? Can I get to know you? And so making sure that you know, hey, who are those single digit members of the community? Who are those people who are actively engaged and they need to be on your short list of people to talk to, right? Those are the people that you need to be talking to on a monthly basis, um, at least, if not more often. Those are the people that you should be, you know, hey, I just found this new article and this is super interesting. I'd love to hear your feedback on it, right? So not only or not always approaching them with, hey, can we get feedback on this beta product? But just talking about the emerging field in general, because the more that you can establish yourself as someone who's also interested in that field, I'm sure they're aware of the fact that there's not many people. And so often that turns into a, wait, there's someone else like me. There's someone else who wants to talk about that. This is fantastic. Let's talk. Right. And so you'll wind up finding that those core people who are at the start of that emerging field are now your core community members and are the ones who are really engaged and are really going to help. And so then when you turn around and go, Hey, we just released a new feature would you mind hopping on a quick call and I can walk you through it and you can give me your feedback? They're likely more than, more often than not, very willing to hop on that call with you to give you that feedback because again, you've already built that relationship. You already know each other. You already know that you can trust where the other person's coming from. You know that you share the same viewpoints on things. And so it's it's really about building that relationship person to person. Um, I don't work in a, in a DevOps space primarily anymore. And I still like some of my actual friends, like people that I talk to via Slack and text and meet up with at conferences. Some of my legit in-person personal friends are people that I met early on because I built those relationships with them and we grew into that industry together. That's amazing. Uh, Yeah. And I feel like It, it just takes so much time to build that community, right? And I think everyone, it you know, it's, it's, you want to find a fast or easy or quick way to do it, yeah. but it's just, it just sounds like the, to do it well, to do it authentically, to have those lasting relationships, mm-hmm. you just got to put in the work and time yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, and surround yourself with people who believe in you and trust you and will, mm-hmm. will allow you to do that too, right? Because of yes. course, if the leadership doesn't believe in it or understand it, yeah, it's yeah. Not, not quite going to work out um, yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, that's well, I think, super interesting. 
I think especially in an emerging field and when you're getting started with those few relationships, making sure that you're communicating those things back internally is incredibly important because if you can say, Hey, there's literally only eight other people who are looking into these same topics, but I'm the person who's in contact with them more often than not. Then again, the company starts to go, Oh, hang on. Okay. Nick is the person who knows all of those people. They're the person who has contact with those people, right? And you don't necessarily need to become a gatekeeper of like, I'm the only, I'm the only person who can talk to Melanie. No one else can talk to Melanie. You have to go through me. I'm not giving away Melanie's contact information, like, right? You don't want to be that protective of that community, but you'll find that people in the company start to come back and go, hey, could you go ask that group what they think about this topic? Could you go find out? If they're noticing these patterns, because you'll have been for the last six months saying, Hey, I just met with that group again. Here's the new things they're seeing. Here's the things that we should take into account as we're building out the product or as we're moving in this direction. And so you're, you're providing that content and directional information as far as here's the way the, the new industry is growing and the, the places we should be as a result, which is incredibly valuable as you're getting started in a brand new field. Yeah. And doing it all organically and authentically. That's the key. It's just, yeah, yeah. there's no, and formula it takes for time. It. There's no, yeah. there's no magic formula. There's no, Hey, we can do this in six weeks time. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's, it goes back to, you know, does the company actually value the community or is it just, Oh, we need a community because that's going to set us apart from our co- competition. Like it might, but if your if your goal is to set us apart from the competition in the next two months, sorry, I can't help you. Right, and that's that's a conversation that needs to happen sooner rather than later. If that's a situation that you're in, because that's right. that's one that unfortunately doesn't change overnight. Yep. All right. Well, we are uh, at time, uh, so uh, wanted to just do a couple closing remarks. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining. We'll be posting this video and a condensed uh, blog post on the Uncommon blog, on the on our Common Room YouTube channel. Um, please also feel free to join our Uncommon community Slack. We can connect with other community leaders and have discussions like this uh, going forward. Uh, one last bit um, for everyone who joined, you know, you'll have some, uh, we have something that we'd like to share with you. Um, so please look out for an email from Rebecca, our head of community later today. And finally, Mary, thank you again so much for your time and sharing your insights uh, with us on this book club. Uh, is there anywhere else or how else should people connect with you? I see your, your Twitter handle in your name on Zoom. Yeah, I Twitter is kind of my go-to. Uh, it's usually the easiest, quickest place to get a hold of me. Um, you can also check out more blog posts and things on my website, which is just marythingval.com um, or marygrace.community if you don't want to figure out how to spell Thingval. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye.